Well, it is a pleasure to introduce the Reverend Dr. Mark Worthing and how appropriate that he should be giving this first lecture because as I mentioned, it was Mark that Tony sought out to help him in his search for an organisation or organisations to support. Mark is a fellow of his caste and a founding member of the International Society of Science and Religion. He has two doctoral degrees, one in philosophy of science and one in theology, written under the supervision of the eminent German theologian, Wolfhard Pannenberg. He's currently the pastor of Emanuel Lutheran Church, North Adelaide, as well as an adjunct lecturer and thesis supervisor at Flinders University and the University of Divinity. Mark has published various books and articles in theology, as well as in science fiction and fantasy. One of his books, entitled God, Creation and Contemporary Physics, won the International 1997 Templeton Book Prize for Science and Faith Book of the Year. One final anecdote that I learnt just this afternoon, Mark is a bit of a runner. Unfortunately, Mark had uh, problems with his knees and his back last year, so he decided to take up walking. And uh, three months or so, Mark can correct the story if I get it wrong, but three months or so after take, taking up walking, and I don't mean the sort of walking that you and I do, I mean that sort of race walking, three months or so after taking up that sort of walking, uh, he, he won a silver medal at the national championships for his age group. <laughs> Mark is a very physically fit person too. Please welcome Reverend Dr Mark Worthy to speak to us on unlikely allies, monotheism and the rise of natural science. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for everyone for attending tonight. It's especially good to have members of Tony's family here. This is exactly the kind of event that Tony would have quite enjoyed and would have been certainly the last one to leave the room. <laughs> for every last bit of conversation, which he so much uh, enjoyed. The title of the lecture this evening is Unlikely Allies, Monotheism and the Rise of Natural Science. It's an exploration in the history of science and the history of religion. And it's looking at an area that has been a field of interest for well over a century and has become of late somewhat controversial. In fact, a quite heated dispute has arisen recently over the precise role that Christianity in particular and religion in general have played in the rise of the natural sciences. The general consensus among historians of science up until recently is well summarized by the Australian historian of science, Peter Harrison, who wrote, could modern science have arisen outside the theological matrix of Western Christendom? It's difficult to say. What can be said for certain is that it did arise in that environment and that theological ideas underpin some of its central assumptions. Those who argue for the incompatibility of science and religion will draw little comfort from history. But some proponents of Christianity, particularly Dina Jesusa and What's So Great About Christianity, and Rodney Stark and For the Glory of God, Monotheism Led to Reformation, Science, and the End of Slavery, have claimed much more than this. They've argued that Christianity has been the necessary and essential cause for the rise of science and Christianity alone. They've argued that science would not have and could not have arisen apart from foundational Christian thinking. These claims have gone beyond the more nuanced claims of previous studies of the historical relationship between science and faith. Such views, not unexpectedly, provoked a response from those aligned with the new atheist camp, particularly from Richard Carrier and from Jerry Coyne. In separate works, they have argued that the view that religion played a role in the rise of science is at best misguided. In fact, they contended that no positive role was played by religion in the rise of science, but instead religion, especially Christianity, has historically resisted science. So that leads to the question, what's actually going on? I'd like to present three parts of this paper. The first is a brief overview of the various, let's see, get this working of the various theories concerning 
how religion or some aspects of religion might have played a role in the rise of science. <clears throat> One thing I learned in some years I spent before going into parish ministry as working in research institutes is that when you look at an area to investigate and you find that it seems like everyone imaginable has already done a study in the field, rather than give up, you do a meta-study. Which means you do a study of all the studies and summarize what everyone else has said. You don't actually have to get your hands what with any details or what results, you put them together. There have been so many studies and books and papers claiming that one religious perspective or another has led to the rise of science or contributed uh, that I've worked on a little bit of a meta-study of these. I can't give all the details here, but just a brief summary to give you an idea of some of the kind of claims that are out there. First of all, and one of the oldest, is that science arose out of Puritan England. Between 1938 and 1975, at least four separate books have appeared arguing that modern science owed its origins not just to religion, not just to monotheism, not just to Christianity, not just to Protestantism, not just to Reformed Protestantism, but specifically to Reformed English Puritan Protestantism. Another book by Hoykus, his classic Religion and the Rise of Modern Science, gave attention to the role of English Puritans, but argued that it was Calvinism more generally, and the so-called Protestant work ethic to which modern science owed its inception. It's true that there were a number of leading con contributors coming out of 17th century England, while many of these individuals, not surprisingly, had a Puritan influence, as seen, for instance, in the strong Puritan representation among the founding members of the Royal Society in London in 1660, Christians of other denominational persuasions could be forgiven for thinking perhaps too much was being claimed. In fact, they argued that science arose out of Protestantism more generally. Martin Luther, for example, expressed favorable views toward natural sciences as independent disciplines already in the early 16th century, as did John Calvin. Luther's colleagues at the University of Wittenberg included some of Copernicus's early supporters. Luther was very clear that the study of nature had merit in its own right and was to be independent of the study of theology. Peter Harrison, again, in his book The Bible, Protestantism, and the Rise of Natural Science, argued that the particular Protestant emphasis on the study and exegesis of sacred text laid down a methodology that led to the scientific investigation of the natural world. His theory suggests that the historian of science pursuing this line of research should be looking not for what was unique to English Puritanism, but at what was unique to Protestantism. John Dillenberger's classic 1961 book, Protestant Thought and Natural Science, is one such major exploration of the role played by Protestantism in general and the rise of science. Yet for all the many books and discussions about the role played by Protestant theology and the rise of modern science, the story of the historical relationship between science and faith could not be adequately covered in an examination of Protestant contributions alone. Many advances in science could be traced to times and places in which Protestantism had no influence. Some argue that science arose of medieval and Renaissance Catholicism. Indeed, the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries was clearly not a purely Protestant affair. An important preparatory role was played by the monastery and cathedral schools, which taught medicine and natural philosophy, as well as theology, and out of which the early European universities grew. The role of Hortus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas in adopting Aristotelian philosophy to Christian thought was also critical. And we must also remember that people like Copernicus and Galileo, among others, were part of the Roman Catholic Church. And the first scientific society in Europe was Roman Catholic and predated the foundation of the Royal Society by more than half a century. The role of medieval Catholicism is highlighted by the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, who claimed that, I quote, faith in the possibility of science generated antecedently to the development of modern scientific theory is an unconscious derivative from medieval Catholic theology. Whitehead notes particularly the influence of two 6th century theologians, St. Benedict and Gregory the Great, who, he argued, contributed to the Renaissance of Europe, including 
a more effective scientific mentality than that of the modern world. It's clear that Roman Catholics also played an early and key role in the development of modern science in Europe. Copernicus was a minor cleric who died in good standing with the church. And Galileo, despite his disputes with the hierarchy of the church, never saw himself as anything but a Roman Catholic Christian. While 17th century Puritans were making significant contributions in science, they were nearly equaled by Jesuits during the same period. Regardless of the specific and distinctive contributions of both Protestant and Catholic thinking in the 16th and 17th centuries, the scientific revolution in Europe and the subsequent development of modern science as we know it owes a great deal to both the Protestant Reformation and those coming out of what's sometimes called the Catholic Reformation or Catholic Counter-Reformation. So both Protestants and Catholics from the era. In this light, the challenge was to scholars to find something distinctive to Western Christendom and share credit for the rise of science more broadly within the Western Christian tradition. This is the view advocated by physicist and Benedictine priest Stanley Yaki, who argued in his 1974 Gifford Lectures that it was rational theism that, necessi that necessarily gave rise to modern science and that this was manifest most fully in the Christian West. But this account of the religious contribution to the origins of natural science still falls short of providing a comprehensive theory of the relationship between monotheism and the rise of science. It relies on defining science in such a way that we only seek to explain the kind of scientific approach and results arising particularly in Western Europe and in the periods of the 16th and 17th centuries. It also assumes that only Christian monotheism contributed significantly and positively to the rise of science. The oldest tradition of the Abrahamic monotheistic faiths has tended to make the fewest formal claims of responsibility for the rise of science. Yet it has been noted that many of the features of Christian and Islamic thought that made the rise of science originated in Judaism. The influence of Jewish philosophers, physicians, and scientists throughout medieval Christendom and early Islam must be noted as also the significant number of Jewish scientists in recent centuries. It has been suggested that the Talmudic method of argumentation and the interaction with other faiths through the centuries of diaspora contributed to an openness to critical thinking that played a key role in the rise of science. What can be said is that certainly Jewish thought and culture played a role. But before the great strides from the Western post-Reformation Christendom and even before the medieval rediscovery of Aristotle, a significant period of advancement in scientific thinking discovery had occurred in the Islamic world. Muslim philosophers and scientists like Abu Ali ibn Sina, commonly known as Ibn Sina, and Ali ibn al-Haythan were far more than simple forerunners of modern science in their methodologies and in their results. Centuries before science began to take significant hold in the Christian West, remarkable advances were being made by Muslim scholars. The Persian Abu Bakr al-Razi is remembered for his original contributions to medicine and for his collation of Indian, Greek, and Middle Eastern medical knowledge. Ibn al-Haythan, an accomplished mathematician, physicist, and astronomer, examined and questioned existing theories, rejecting those that did not match the physical data. He articulated an inductive method centuries before Bacon and set off the steps for formulating and verifying hypotheses. The questions he asked about the natural world were intentional and systematic and anticipated many advancements of science in the West by at least six centuries. From the 10th to the 13th centuries, significant centers of scientific learning existed in the Islamic world from Cordova in the West to Cairo in Egypt and particularly in Baghdad and Basra in the east that were unparalleled up to that time. But Islamic science, of course, did not arise out of a vacuum. Among the contributing factors to its golden era was the Nestorian Christian contribution to developments in medicine, science, and philosophy in and around Baghdad from 786 to 1258. 
figures such as Hunyan ibn Isaac, Isaac ibn Hunyan, Buhana ibn Serbian, Jibrio ibn Bakishtu, and many other prominent historian Christians played vital roles in the rise of science in the Golden Age of Islam. Hunyan ibn Isaac, for instance, at the end of the 7th century, threw himself into the massive task of translating Greek and medieval philosophical texts into Arabic and Syriac, and gathered around him a team composed mostly of fellow Nestorians who had the advantage of a Greek language background, having been forced to migrate the, uh, from the um, Eastern Roman Empire um, because of their religious beliefs. He personally translated 116 separate works from the Greek philosophers and physicians. His renown was such that for many years he served as head of the famous Baghdad Library and Translation Center, known as the House of Wisdom. Not only did historians play a vital role in the translation movement, but they were also key contributors to the development of the Islamic Hospital, to original medical research within, with notable contributions to the anatomy of the eye, pharmacology, description of the placebo effect, and to the development of a system of categorization of medicines according to their effects. Before them even, a rich tradition existed um, within Neoplatonism, not often seen as a time and period in which we see scientific development, but associated with this era and Neoplatonic way of looking at the world more people like Origen, who's credited with being one of the co-founders of Neoplatonism, and Augustine uh, of Hippo, who's credited with being the first person to uh, successfully describe or accurately describe uh, the nature of time and its relation to matter. So things going on even there. Of course, the historians, the medieval Muslims in and around Baghdad, particularly later medieval Christians, did not simply arise and work out of a vacuum. The Nestorians particularly provided a link to the scientific, medical, and philosophical knowledge of the Greeks. That link was picked up by early Muslims and passed on to medieval Christianity. It was the Greek philosophers who were vital for the foundational ideas that undergird the process, the progress of science through all these periods that followed later. Importantly, many of the strides made by the Greeks occurred at the very same time the key philosophers were moving intellectually away from predominant polytheism of their culture and toward a philosophical monotheism. As historian of science Stephen Mason points out, Plato saw that any philosophy with a claim to generality must include a theory as to the nature of the universe. Plato accordingly evolved a natural philosophy that was harmonious with and subordinate to his theological views. And Plato's God differed from the gods of the Bronze Age in that he did not order the universe by a process of organic procreation, but by realizing an intellectual design. The most important feature of the ordering of the universe from chaos, according to Plato, was the formulation of a rational design for the world by a creator. The writings of the Greeks, especially those of Aristotle, in turn played a pivotal role in the golden era of Islamic philosophy and the rise of universities in 13th century Europe, and the subsequent progress toward the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries. While Aristotle's belief in a first cause and prime mover was not one of religious devotion, the intellectual movement toward belief in a single deity was more than an incidental component of his worldview. So what does all this mean? The various parochial theories concerning religion and the rise of science, which we have alluded to, carry weight in part because the key periods of advancement in science tend to coincide with very strong monotheistic intellectual communities and traditions. The advances of science in ancient Greece correspond with the emerging philosophical monotheism of Plato and Aristotle. Scientific advances in the early Christian classical world correspond with the theological contributions of thinkers like Origen of Alexandria and Augustine of Hippo. 
scientific progress, especially in medicine, associated with the golden era of Islam in and around Baghdad, under the Abbasids, corresponds with the prevalent Muslim intellectual culture of that era and the strong, destroying Christian community. Many advances in the late medieval and early Renaissance period of Europe owe much to the thought of thinkers like Thomas Aquinas. Advances made in 17th century Catholic lands were strongly linked to the Jesuits, and the explosion of scientific advances in 16th to 18th century Europe, particularly England, coincided with the pervasive influence of various forms of Protestantism. There is no shortage, historically, of correlations between strong monotheistic intellectual traditions and instances of significant scientific advancement. But a correlation of monotheistic environments and periods of growth in science does not equate to a cause-effect relationship. The simple fact that two things happen in and about the same time doesn't mean that one is the cause and the other is the effect. It certainly raises suspicions that something could be going on, but one weakness in many of these arguments is the assumption that because one thing happened followed by another, one is the cause, one is the effect, end of the story. And also, if such a cause-effect relationship does exist, we further have to inquire as to whether monotheism is the only cause, or even the primary cause. Before we take a fresh look at the thesis that monotheism played a decisive role in the rise of science, and the philosophical arguments, I believe, that support this thesis, we need to look at a few objections to the thesis first. And this is the second part. So we've done the little, we've done a meta-survey of my meta-survey. <laughs> And that's a bit of background as well to what's going on. And the thing to note from that is almost all these people arguing these points were arguing only for their specific religious tradition, to exclusion of the others. Almost no one is arguing that monotheism in general is the cause. They were arguing for Islam and a certain kind of Islam, Protestantism and a certain kind of Protestantism, Catholicism and a certain kind of Catholicism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So just a few objections, how am I doing? I've been given 45 minutes, I might take 46, we'll see. <laughs> Objection one to the basic thesis that monotheism played such a role. Competing theories cancel one another out, as we just said. If all these different groups are arguing that it is their particular religious tradition that caused the rise of science, necessarily they have to argue why the other claims are not valid. So if you have 12 different or 20 different groups claiming their specific religious tradition is the cause, you have that many groups arguing against each one of the other groups. So if I'm one of those groups, and I'm one of 12, I've already got 11 different groups arguing why my claims are not valid. So they tend to shoot one another in the foot by saying necessarily, uh, it must be just us. And the main way that's done usually is defining science in such a way that it only applies to your period. The key move in science, according to some of my friends who are Islamic uh, historians, was what took place in the golden year of Islam. What happened before was not enough. What happened later was simply necessary follow-on. Therefore, that's the key period. Many claim the same thing, what happened in the scientific revolution, uh, particularly in England and in Europe, in the 16th to 18th centuries. What happened before didn't count. What happened then did, etc., etc. And so if you define science that narrowly, you limit uh, any looking for causative factors to what happened in that particular land, that region, that particular time. Um, and of course, the upshot of the multiplicity of such openly parochial arguments um, is that too much time has been devoted to explaining why the other's arguments don't stand up. Objection two. Scientific strides were also made in non-monotheistic cultures. We are continually upgrading our assessment of the technical achievements and abilities of ancient societies. The early Greeks, Persians, Babylonians, Indians, Incas, and Chinese, to name just some of the more prominent, were capable of great feats of building and engineering, which required understanding uh, that was very advanced in mathematics, geometry, metalworking, etc. And these were largely polytheistic uh, and sometimes animistic societies and groups. As Jerry Coyne states the objection, geometry was invented by polytheists in ancient Greece. Do we give polytheism credit for geometry then? That's a good question. If all these things had been achieved in cultures that were not monotheistic, 
Can it be argued that monotheism contributed anything essential to the rise of science? Or as Quine suggests, that polytheism be credited with the achievements made in earlier years? Significantly, most historians of science make a significant distinction between the technological knowledge and ability exhibited in ancient civilizations and what developed later, beginning with uh, the later Greek period. Uh, referring to these former often as precursors to modern science or sometimes as ancient science. What seems to have been lacking, according to the stories of science in these societies, is the quest for understanding why things work the way they do. It was enough to make sure your calculations and understandings and make sure the pyramid did not collapse on itself. How the knowledge of these various workings were interconnected was not an issue that seemed to exhibit great concern. There was no articulated methodology for expanding our, our understanding of the natural world. Admittedly, to some extent, these kind of questions must have been present, but they do not appear to have been consistently pursued and integrated into any kind of overall approach to understanding the natural world. So there seems to be some sort of divide that does take place here, is one response to that objection, that the big stride started uh, in the later period of the ancient Greeks. Objection three, the different forms of monotheism found in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam make it difficult to claim monotheism as a common factor. Some groups see God um, as a being who works organically from a bit of a distance. Others see God uh, almost in an atomistic, uh, fideous kind of sense that simply says every single motion action um, is, takes place uh, through fiat of that God. Jewish and Christian scholars have long queried just how monotheistic Christianity is with its commitment to the doctrine of the Trinity. Whether God acts through natural causes only, whether God acts in some other ways, the implications for understanding the natural world in all the different manifestations of monotheism end up being remarkably similar. The belief in a divine rationality that creates a comprehensible and rational world is present in every case. As much as we might like to think that our own particular version of monotheism gives some unique advantage to the scientific endeavor, the truth appears to be that whatever it is about monotheism that may have played a critical role in the rise of science, it is common to the basic idea of a single creator God and is not dependent upon any one particular expression of this belief. Objection four. Religion, especially monotheistic religion, actually opposed the advance of science. And this is one put forward by many of the new atheists quite strongly, saying, how can religion or monotheism, particularly Christianity, take credit um, for the rise of science when it's been dedicated completely to the opposition of science? And they point usually to the same things, um, the opposition of some scientists. The thesis comes forward strongly uh, at the end of the 19th century by two writers, one named Draper and the other White, uh, who wrote histories showing how science was opposed by the rise of Christianity, particularly. Um, they point out the opposition to Copernicus, to Galileo. Uh, they claim that the church taught that the earth was flat and this needed to be rejected, etc., etc. Uh, most historians of science now agree that these claims are at best exaggerated. In some cases, like the flat earth belief being taught by anyone within the church uh, was simply manufactured. Uh, but yet, there was opposition. As with many objections, there's enough grain of truth in something taken seriously. The Spanish physician and contributor to understanding of the circulatory system, Mikio Servetus, was put to death, burned at the stake in Geneva on the orders of John Kelvin. And Giordano Bruno, a monk and astronomer, was a few years later, burnt at the stake in Rome. There are two sad examples. While accusations of radical religious views play key roles in both these tragic executions, the fact that each was also a significant scientific thinker within the day cannot be overlooked. So it is that Jerry Coyne, author of Why Evolution is True, posted 11 reasons why the idea that science came from religion must be rejected. His fifth reason is this. Religion has, of course, also repressed the search for knowledge. Not only do we have the cases of Galileo and Bruno, but also the after discouragement of the use of reason by many church fathers. And intriguingly, he singles out Luther, 
read the full version of my paper and point for response to that. And free thinkers like Spinoza were regularly persecuted by religion, in his case, Judaism. End of the quote. As already pointed out, the very real persecution of Bruno was based on his theology, not his science, and the difficulties of Galileo had much to do with his personal conflict with the Pope. It's a stretch, I believe, to make a serious claim that religion, and particularly Christianity, made an orchestrated effort to repress the search for knowledge. This is, of course, not to say that some religious teachers and leaders did indeed fear science and oppose its finding. It is not surprising that some religious leaders, as they saw the rising influence of science, sought either to stop or control science. Similarly, some modern scientists seem to have an aversion to religion. But this does not imply that science as an entity is anti-religious. These incidents, regardless of their exact circumstances, do not negate the role played by monotheistic belief as a whole in the rise of science. They represent much more political reaction to a perceived and at times real loss of influence and power. And finally, objection number five, it could be asked, why did not all monotheistic cultures show evidence of interest in scientific thought? If there is something particular about monotheistic religion and thought that provided a fertile ground for the rise of science, it could be asked, why did so many monotheistic cultures show little or no trace of such developments? Because the assumption would be if there's something about monotheism, every place monotheism was practiced, should have been bubbling over with scientific activity. Why did little happen within Christianity until the 13th century, and then largely only in the West? Why did more development not continue to occur among some of the Muslim societies that made such impressive early strides? Or why in the long history of Judaism before the rise of Christian and Islamic monotheism did nothing like modern science begin to break through? Richard Carrier argued that Christianity's claim to have given rise to science, I quote, violates one of the most basic principles of causality. When the cause is in place, its effect is seen. Christianity fully dominated the whole of the Western world from the 5th to the 15th century, and in all those thousand years there was no scientific revolution, and no scientific revolution in the eastern half of the Christian world either. One response to this lack of progress in science during this period is to point out that the existence of a strong monotheistic worldview, however instrumental, is not alone sufficient to explain the rise of modern science in its various phases, which is one mistake made by some recent American arguments that Christianity and Christianity alone is the efficient cause uh, for the rise of science. It's not simply Christianity, but other factors as well that appear to have been important. Carrier assumes that the argument being made is that Christianity and Christianity alone provided the fertile soil for modern science. But the argument is more nuanced than this. Other factors must also be taken into account. Political stability, intellectual freedom, relative economic prosperity, and a culture of learning even the invention of the printing press have all been vital factors at various times and places. It could be argued that there were deficiencies also of monotheistic understanding and practice in those regions and eras in which science did not thrive to explain the lack of progress in scientific thinking. In this sense, Carrier's claim that Christianity fully dominated the Western world from 500 to 1500 is misleading. Anyone who's a historian of this age realizes uh, that there's a long struggle uh, between ideas and to suggest that Christian ideology rightly understood was the dominant factor alone uh, is not quite correct. The church is an institution, and often a corrupt institution at that, certainly had a dominant influence during this period. But many other non- and sub-Christian ideologies and structures were also present in many places. The feudal structure, pagan superstitions, the nightly concept of chivalry, mass migrations of peoples, the plague, and many other factors significantly influenced and shaped medieval life and thought. But none of these can be attributed to Christianity as a system of belief. Healthy and properly understood monotheism appears to have gone hand in hand with tolerance and intellectual freedom. Where these were suppressed or were not able to develop the positive aspects of monotheism that encouraged scientific investigation of the physical world were also not able to flourish. In places where they lined up, amazing things happened. Now, part three, and this is the actual lecture. The rest is introduction. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit that's probably the most original. Uh, what's original about the first bit is actually looking at uh, all the various claims and saying, let's look at monotheism in general. Not a lot have done that. Uh, looking at the objections is necessary to give some, well, wait a minute, what could have been going on? 
But we need to do more than this. If monotheism played a role, what was it about monotheism? Does it actually explain anything? We have to do more than say, look at this. This happened at the same time this happened. Therefore, this must be the cause and this must be the effect. The case of the role of monotheism and the rise of science, we briefly reviewed. The various parochial arguments that we looked at have tended to make three fundamental mistakes, which any case for the rise, for, uh, for the role of monotheism and the rise of science must avoid. First mistake, these arguments err when they claim that one particular religion, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, or one branch of a particular religion, for instance, Calvinism or English Puritanism, alone gave rise to science, rather than more generally, monotheism as a whole. Second, these arguments err when they assume that science arose substantially in a single era associated, coincidentally, with their particular religious tradition, while ignoring the reliance of the developments of this particular period on previous steps or stages in the rise of science. Science just didn't come out of a vacuum. It came in stages and steps, each one relying on the one before. These arguments err when the positive role of a particular religious context or contribution once established is treated as if it were the only cause for the rise of science. A contributing cause is not also ipso facto a necessary cause. Ignored are the presence of other significant positive factors influencing progress in science in a particular era. Therefore, any theory concerning the role played by monotheism in the rise of science must avoid these errors by not overstating its claims in the pursuit of making a case for a particular monotheistic tradition, or even monotheism generally. So the following arguments, um, I think, need to be made, and they should have the following things in common, or kept in mind. They should not be made regarding monotheism in general. They should recognize that modern science progressed in stages through a number of distinct historical periods, and they must recognize that influences apart from monotheism also played significant roles in the rise of science. So just why might have monotheism given an advantage and produced fertile soil for the rise of science? First, we'll get to this one. And this is important because Unless a theory can explain something, it doesn't have much force or power in the scientific community, and the same is, is true for history. Monotheism created a context in which questions could be asked of the natural world. We don't usually think about this because we've all grown up in secularized society, monotheistic societies, perhaps atheistic societies. Very few of us have ever experienced, unless we grew up in some place like India, a generally polytheistic society thought patterns are very different. In the ancient world, that is to say in the world as it was before the proclamation of Christ brought the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the wider attention of the nations, there was little concept of secularity. Even among the Greeks who gave us the antecedents of many of our modern philosophical systems through Plato and Aristotle and spawned concepts such as democracy and the city-state, there was no room for the purely secular. What the ancient Jewish faith sought to accomplish in its own districts, Christianity made a reality in much of the Western world. Later, Islam carried these ideas even further to the Middle East and beyond. The gods, spirits, and magic were taken out of rocks, trees, and hills. The high places were torn down or simply forgotten, and all sacrality and divine power were concentrated in the one true God. Animism, which is the worship of spirits and ancestors, within rocks and trees and other objects, and polytheism, the worship of multiple gods, were largely abandoned in favor of the worship of a single all-powerful god. As sacrality became centralized in the being of God, particularly the Judeo-Christian God, the physical world itself became secularized. For the first time outside of Israel, one could truly distinguish between the sacred and the secular. <coughs> and emerging natural science was no longer faced with the daunting task of challenging a sacred world filled with spirits and gods and holy places and holy people. Monotheism by its very nature encouraged the asking of questions about the functions of the natural world. For this reason, Max Weber argued that it was this desacralization of the world that laid the groundwork for the scientific approach 
to the world. But why would this be the case? One might think that monotheism, especially those with strong affirmations of God's sovereignty, would have been a little different to polytheism and the tendency to attribute all causes directly to the actions of a single deity, eliminating the need to ask questions about natural causes. If a flood of drought occurred, then the question to be asked would be, why was God angry? And what must we do to appease God? One might think that monotheism would simply have rolled up the functions of the various competing deities into one package. But this isn't what happened. Belief in one God led people to look increasingly to natural causes. H. Richard Niebuhr, in his extended essay, Radical Monotheism in Western Culture, argued that by its nature, radical monotheism would include reverence for beings, inorganic, perhaps, perhaps ideal, that though not living, claim the wondering of us other creatures. This is the case, he explained, because radical monotheism dethrones all absolutes short of the principle of being itself, and at the same time it references every relative existent. End of quote. This is the case because genuine monotheism calls us to value and be concerned with all things that come from the hand of the one God, including that which is not sentient, and even that which is not animate, while distinguishing these things from God. If nature itself is not divine, but the creation of the divine one, then we can ask questions of nature without offending any particular God. We can even conduct experiments on it. In this way, monotheism helped create a context in which science was free to evolve. Second, monotheism in the unity of knowledge. The Muslim doctrine of Tawid is well known. The unity of God had implications for the unity of what God creates and for the unicity of knowledge in the created world. It was commitment to the doctrine of Tawid that motivated many of the early Muslim philosophers and scientists. Christian thinkers likewise saw the correlation between the oneness of God and the unity of knowledge about the world created by God. If a single divine being was responsible for the whole of the created natural order, then all knowledge about this natural order must be fundamentally interconnected. Monotheistic thinkers not only tended to ask after natural causes and explanations, but also to view these causes as fundamentally linked, having a common ground in one creator God. As the theologian Wolfhard Pannenberg said, if God is sovereign, as the almighty creator of everything, there should be no animal, no human being, and certainly not human nature. There should be no stone on this earth that could be adequately understood without this God. In other words, we don't need some prior decision of faith. We only need to remove our prejudices and look on reality as it presents itself to us. Monotheism not only set people free to ask questions of nature, necessary for the emergence of science, but it also suggested a unitary view of the world and the knowledge of the world that has proved vital for the rise of science. Einstein once famously quipped that he was not particularly interested in individual phenomena. I want, he said, to know the thoughts of God. The rest are mere details. Well, it is inappropriate to take this comment as some sort of statement of faith on Einstein's part. It does illustrate the commonly held assumption among scientific thinkers that there is an underlying and unifying logic to the universe. So the third point to consider is the mind of God and the natural order. It's not surprising that one of the core assumptions of monotheism, that a logical mind will produce a logical world, was important for the emergence of science. If the mind of God is coherent and comprehensible, then the world which God creates will also be coherent and comprehensible, and can be approached and investigated with the expectation that it can be understood. It's hard to underestimate the significance of that working assumption in the minds of many who approach questions of the natural order. The tendency to ask questions of the natural world was not only a result of the freedom monotheism provided to ask such questions, but also arose from the belief in divine intelligence. Again, the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead saw belief in divine rationality, especially as it arose in Western conceptions of God, as vital for the rise of science in Europe. He believed the formation of, scientific, of the scientific movement in Europe was only possible because of belief that, I quote, every detailed occurrence can be correlated with its antecedents in a perfectly definite manner. But where did this belief come from? Whitehead explained, it must come from the medieval insistence on the rationality of God 
conceived as with the personal energy of Jehovah and with the rationality of a Greek philosopher. Every detail is supervised and ordered. The search into nature could only result, he said, in the vindication of the faith and rationality. In other words, if God is rational, then there should be an inherent intelligibility in the universe. As Stanley Jackie contended, the Christian theism of the Middle Ages manifested a broadly shared conviction that a personal, rational, and providential being, absolute and eternal, is the ultimate source of intelligibility insofar as he is creator of all things, visible and invisible. Monotheism and intellectual freedom. Though examples of suppression of intellectual freedom among the monotheistic traditions are numerous, it can be argued that the source documents of Abrahamic monotheism, as well as the fundamental assumptions of philosophical monotheism, lead in another direction. A God whose existence and power does not depend upon our devotion and who does not require our defense is a God who can be questioned. Read, for instance, the account of Job. And who can respond to doubt with evidence rather than threat. Look at the account of St. Thomas. Healthy monotheism produces sufficient confidence in its adherence to be able to live with religious and intellectual diversity. Human nature has often suppressed this tendency within particular monotheistic traditions but when it has been rightly grasped, for instance, as we saw in the golden age of Islam under the Abbasids, the impact of the advance of scientific thinking has been profound. Monotheism, peoples of the book, and literacy. Numerous studies have been done on the impact of the reliance of Jews, Christians, and Muslims upon their sacred text. It's not without significance that all three major monotheistic religions have been religions of the book. While sacred texts were known to exist in other religious traditions, the role of Western, sorry, the role of written revelation of Judaism, Christian, and Islam was unprecedented. The religious texts of these monotheistic religions served as a great impetus for literacy. The existence of scribes and literate audiences to read the sacred books they copied out meant that other ideas could also be more readily written down and exchanged between cultures and passed down to the generations. Monotheistic religions provided the language for treating complex topics in both metaphysical and natural philosophy, as well as an audience capable of understanding this language. This phenomenon may have been entirely incidental in the case of the three great Abrahamic traditions, and not belonging to the essence of the nature of monotheism as such, but nevertheless, its impact is profound and associated with all three major monotheistic traditions. So these are some of the things that we see in general. I've also been asked to say, was there not anything at all distinctive of Christianity? Was there nothing that motivated these people in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries who were such, many of them, active Christian thinkers to dedicate their lives to studying the material world? It's true, while monotheism broadly conceived, I believe, provided the fertile ground upon the modern science and the research culture associated with it could flourish. Individual monotheistic traditions certainly have also made their unique contributions. My own tradition, that of Christian monotheism, there are features which further supported the growth of science. The most significant, I'll just mention one here because time is short, is the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation. The theology of the Incarnation affirms both the value of the material world and our scientific knowledge of this world. Within the philosophical milieu of ancient Hellenism, the value of the physical world is often relegated to secondary importance, or even seen as an evil compared to the value and the reality of the spiritual realm. The idea that God as a pure spiritual being would take on human flesh was simply preposterous. Long battles were fought within early Christianity against attempts by various forms of Gnostic and ascetic movements to reject the idea that God could or would take on human flesh. The central affirmation of the Incarnation, which prevailed, was not only a victory for Orthodox Christian belief, it also served to underscore in the minds of Christian thinkers the value of the physical world. If God takes on human flesh, then the physical world has inherent worth. The Incarnation dignifies the physical. It makes the physical something worth valuing, something worth redeeming, and something worth studying and understanding. The Incarnation is an affirmation of the value and nobility of the physical world, including human beings. Included in the Christian understanding of the Incarnation is also the idea that God in Christ suffers. 
The cruciform shape of Christian incarnational belief predisposes Christian thinkers to value the importance of struggle and suffering in the world. Ideas, incidentally, which came to the fore with Darwin's concept of natural selection. The doctrine of the incarnation is one of the key formative doctrines for the Christian view of the natural world, and it's one, I think, that motivated many early Christian scientists. In conclusion, and I'm three minutes over, so I'm going to read this backwards to get that time back. All the factors discussed above are significant in explaining why the greatest strides in modern science, from Plato to Aristotle, to early Christian and Jewish thinkers, to the golden era of Islam, to the explosion of scientific discovery among European Catholic and Protestants in the 16th to 18th centuries, occurred when monotheistic thought was strongest and most dominant in intellectual thinking of the day. Without these key contributions of monotheistic belief systems, it is unlikely that modern science and the research cults associated with it would have arisen in the form that it did. The implication of this are many, but two points merit specific attention. Firstly, consider this. If the context created by monotheistic belief systems formed an environment conductive to the development of science, then these same developments in science and in scientific thinking also, in all likelihood, played a positive role in supporting the further development of robust and healthy expressions of monotheistic faith. The two great ideas and movements intellectually that have shaped Western civilization have been monotheism and science. They're very different, but they grew up together, supported, encouraged one another, and if we spend much attention looking at how much monotheistic faith shaped how science developed, I think we also need to consider how science subsequently shaped how monotheistic faith was able to be accepted and received. The positive impact of significant phases in the rise of science and monotheistic traditions in which these often occurred is an area that merits much further research. The relationship between monotheism and science was not likely one of simple cause and effect, but one of complex mutuality in which each benefited in a variety of ways from the existence of the other. And secondly, the recognition of the role monotheism played in supporting the development of modern scientific worldview, if more widely understood, would do much to counter the warfare model of the relationship between religion and science, which has arisen in the course of the last century. It would also serve to foster a healthier dialogue between the two important ways of thinking about the world that have together shaped our modern Western intellectual tradition. Given the recent uneasy relationship between science and faith, science and monotheism would appear to be, indeed, unlikely allies. Yet, allies they have been, and albeit often unwittingly, allies they remain. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.